Well, today we're going to be talking about Medicaid and Medicaid uh, myths. The first question you might have is, why should I care anyway? Uh, the answer is that Medicaid is one of three government programs that are have been established, paid for by your tax dollars, uh, but they've been established to help older Americans. Uh, the first that everyone's familiar with, well, it should be, is uh, Social Security. Social Security answers the need that older folks have for constant income. Okay, everybody else has need for instant income as well, but as you get older, once you've paid into the system, all right, the Social Security is going to cover that. Pay not a not a great retirement, but something. That was the idea back in the 30s. That's the idea now, is that there will be a source of income paid for by your taxes, right? The taxes that you paid in, uh, you'll get a return on that. The second government program that people need that older Americans are depending on has to do with the fact that in addition to income, people also need health care, day-to-day health care. So you might need a hip or a kidney or cataract surgery, kind of you name it. That's what Medicaid is for. Medicaid, excuse me, I confuse the two myself I, all the time. Very difficult to keep them straight. But Medicare is the second government program that you need, that people need. And the Medicaid, hmm. there I did, did it again. Medicare program, again, tax supported program starts at age 65. And that takes care of you, you know, during your lifetime for acute care is what it's for, as well as, you know, the other care that you receive. So if you need care right now, that's what Medicare is for. It's for acute care. So if it's a hip, if it's a broken bone, if it's cataract surgery, what have you, Medicare is the government supported, meaning, and if I say government, so here's the other thing. If I say government supported, what do I mean? I mean, taxpayer supported. I mean, the government doesn't have any money except what it takes from you. And all of these programs, so gen- you know, the government's so generous while being generous with your own money. You pay in, so you get something back. Uh, I know it's most uh, middle class folks have a hard time with the idea that they would actually get anything back, but that's the reality. This is how it works. You do get something back through Social Security, through Medicare. Now, with Medicare and Social Security, these are the two things that people need after retirement. Okay. And everybody needs these. There's a third need that older Americans have that people eventually will need. And the third need, the third thing that they need is long term care. Long term care is treated very differently than. Social Security, then Medicare. You're treated very differently. It's basically the same idea, which is we have people with a need. Some people pay in, taxpayers pay in, and people get out. Now, if you're receiving Social Security, the government doesn't want to know, well, how much do you have in your bank account? They don't want to know, do you have a a cottage? Do you have an extra automobile? Uh, How much other stuff do you have? What do your other investments look like? Social Security doesn't ask that question. You paid in, you get out. That's the deal. Same way with Medicare. Medicare doesn't care how much you own. So you can have three houses. You still qualify for Medicare. You can have whatever else you want. You don't qualify and you you will still qualify for Medicare. And if you have a need, they're not going to come to you and say, well, the doctor says you need a bypass. Show us your checking account so we can be sure that Medicare is going to pay for that. Medicare doesn't do that at all. That's not how it works. Why doesn't it work that way? Why doesn't the government want to make sure that you're broke before you get Medicare or Social Security? Why don't they do that? Well, because you'd vote them out if they did, all right? 
the Social Security program, the Medicare program, government programs put out there by your representatives. And if they made them means tested, if they said, look, sorry, you've got more than 2000 in the bank, come back and see us when you're broke. And then you can have your bypass. Oh, we'll fix your cataracts when you get rid of the cottage. Okay. Oh, and you better not give the cottage away because we'll penalize you for that as well. That doesn't happen with Social Security or Medicare. Why not? Because you'd vote the bums out. That's why not. The third program, the third need that older folks have is for long-term care. Now it's very different. You say, well, I'll never need long-term care. My kids will take care of me. People think things like that. And back in the day, we really had an issue with what we call the sandwich generation. The sandwich generation were caring for their kids and for their parents as well. I'm not saying it never happens anymore, but boy, it's not what it used to be. It used to be all the time. That was the situation. Nowadays, what you hear from the kids very often is, I had no idea that caring for mom, that caring for dad, would be so overwhelming. I had no idea that it would take so much. I have my kids, I have my job, I have my this and that. Um, I'm just saying you're hearing a lot more of that than we ever used to. So if you're relying on your kids to take care of you, like you took care of your parents, you might wanna rethink that one, okay? 70%, according to the federal government, and all the numbers I use are government numbers, 70%, when you're age 65, you have a 70% chance of needing skilled nursing care, skilled care. The average is three years of skilled care. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you'll be in a nursing home for three years. I'm just saying that when you're 65, 70% of the people when they're 65 eventually will need, on average, three years of skilled care. Again, you can look it up. It's longtermcare.gov. That's the website that has all this information on it. Now, this is, this is pre-COVID numbers. For all I know, the numbers have gone up because they certainly haven't gone down. The percentage of folks who will need skilled care for an average of three years, 20%. 20% of folks will need skilled care for more than five years. Okay? That's the government numbers at age 65. Obviously, as you get older, that number increases. The percentage who require skilled care is, gonna, uh, is going to increase because some of those people will have died and the ones who need skilled care are left. So that's how the, that's how the percentages work. This is not a kind of thing, skilled care is not the sort of thing that only a few people need. It's a real widespread necessity for folks, okay? Now, but here's the question, how are you gonna pay for that? Now, during the COVID, we saw nursing home care, long-term care costs skyrocket. Why do you suppose that happened? Well, let me suggest. A lot of us grew up with many siblings, families, baby boomers, right? Typically had four or more kids in the family. Guess what? Your kids are not having as many kids, right? Your kids are not having as many kids as your parents did, okay? So what we're seeing is a decline in the number of younger people. We're also seeing, because... Baby boomers are, were continuing to age every day. Six, 7,000 people hit those gateway ages, 65, 70, 75. So what we're seeing is the number of older people continues to skyrocket, continues to go up. The number of younger people continues to go down. Consequence of that is the supply of people, the demand for care services is going up the number of people available to provide those services is going down. Why do you suppose 
McDonald's, for example, is paying $16 an hour. Okay. Fast, if, if people with the skill set to work in a, in a, in a fast food restaurant are in such demand that we're, they're paying them. And plus the benefits. I mean, have you ever seen what the benefits are for someone who works at a fast food restaurant? Pretty good benefits, pretty good hourly wage. Okay. Because why? Because there are fewer people to provide those services than ever. Well, do you think it's more pleasant to work in a skilled nursing facility or to provide skilled care? Is it, is that a, more skilled job or a less skilled job? Is it more pleasant or less pleasant than working in a restaurant? Well, some people have a heart for it, but by and large, it's a more skilled job and it's a less pleasant job, okay? So the supply of people willing to provide care is going down, the demand for care is going up. Well, basic economics, right? I mean, whatever, what happens every time Demand goes up and supply goes down. The price goes up. Back in the day, when I first started doing this for skilled nursing care, full-fledged nursing home, right? It was under $3,000 a month. Well, you can't get anything for $3,000 a month. Right now, it's twelve dollars to $15,000 a month. If you're looking for skilled care, if you want someone to come in the home and provide services, $25 an hour used to get you a registered nurse. For $25 an hour, you're lucky if you get the, you know, the person with the purple hair spiked in chains and whatnot. You know what I mean? I mean, it's that's what's going on. It's very expensive to get the care. So even people who've been frugal like you people who've paid it off like you, people who have saved for a rainy day and you think, you've, you think you're okay because, well, I've got $100,000 for long-term care, right? Do you have $100,000 for long-term care because you think that's gonna cover it? Will $100,000 cover three years? Listen, assisted living, we, assisted living, you think of it seven, $8,000 a month these days. That's just assisted living. Add memory care, add some of the other services, it's up around 13,000 very easily in a assisted living situation, okay? This stuff is not cheap. Skilled care, 12 to $15,000 a month. That's just what it is, four to $500 a day. How long is your $100,000? If you put that aside, I think, well, I got my I got my skilled care taken care of. Or if you bought long-term care insurance, a lot of people bought long-term care insurance. You know, when you bought the long-term care insurance, a hundred dollars a day, wow, that was a lot of money. Well, listen, when it's four to five hundred dollars a day, yeah, I guess it's good to have it, but it, it doesn't make that much difference. Okay. Now, what Medicaid is the program that pays for the taxpayer funded program that pays for skilled care. That's what Medicaid does, among other things. There are 40, 50 programs that Medicaid supports. Okay, Medicaid is the name for all of these. We're gonna cover the ones that are most relevant to you. We're gonna be covering those today. And I should say, if you have any questions along the way, we've got two hours here, that's plenty of time. Uh, we got two hours. If you have a question, a particular question you'd like to ask, go to the chat feature. You know the chat feature on your, uh, what is it, Zoom or whatever? Yeah, go to that chat feature on Zoom, okay, and type in your question. Amanda will ask me the question. I will repeat it. She will state it. Are you going to put it up on the screen? We have that working? Whatever. Tell me what the question is. I'll repeat it. And then we'll we'll answer the question. So if you do have a question, you know, if you think, wait a second, are you saying 70% of people will wind up in a nursing home? I'm not saying that. I'm saying 70% of people will need skilled care. Sometimes that's at-home care provided by family members. Sometimes that's assisted living. Sometimes that's skilled nursing care. But it all comes under the heading by the government, 
Again, this is not me using these words. That's the government saying it's skilled care. All right. So if you do have a question, go ahead and tippy type it into the into the chat feature. Uh, we'll get it for you right away. Now, here's the question with Medicaid. It's like Social Security. It's like Medicare in that you paid for this already. Your taxes, the money that you pay in, pays for Medicaid just the same way as it pays for Social Security and pays for Medicare. But here's the difference. Mm -hmm. The difference is you have to be broke to get Medicaid. You say, well, wait a second. I don't have to be broke to get Social Security. I don't have to be broke to get um, to get uh, Medicare. Why do I have to be broke to get Medicaid? And the answer is because you need Medicaid. And this is my view, okay? I didn't ask a congressperson. They said this is it. This is what I this is what I believe because this is seems logical to me. Okay, if you get Social Security at age sixty two, you're going to be voting for a lot more years. Right? If you get Medicare at age sixty five, you're going to be voting for many years to come. So that if they did to you for Social Security or Medicare what they do to you for Medicaid, you'd vote the bums out. Because what Medicaid says is you have to be broke. And remember, three years is all you need long-term care for. Three years, that's it, okay? And those aren't three years followed by 20 years of voting. Those are three years followed by, see you later. That's the end of the day. Now, you'll be voting for those three years. Don't worry about it. I mean, you will be voting. You just won't know who you're voting for. Amanda, could you take down the thing that says no open questions? Because it's it's kind of in the way there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. That way I can see the I can see my board. Okay. So why don't politicians worry? Why don't they have no pro any problem? Why don't they have any problem with insisting that you sell the cottage? that you get rid of the second car, that you deplete your savings down to $2,000 for a single person, that you cut your assets in half or more if you're married. Why do they, why do, they do that? Because they can get away with it. That, I mean, this is my view, because it just makes sense to me. <laughs> they can get away with it. You're not gonna vote them out because you're not voting anymore. It's easy. That's the big difference because Medicaid is supported by your taxes just as Medicare, just as Social Security is. The difference is you have to go broke to get Medicaid. Now, if you do go broke and you're on the Medicaid, what do you get? What are you getting for your money? Well, the answer is a base level of care. Now, is it better to get a base level of care? Better you get the base level than nothing at all? Of course. It's always better to get something rather than nothing. But if you've been in a long-term care facility on the Medicaid, let's say, for a month, let's say you've been in there for a month, how many showers have you had? Well, the answer is three, because they were supposed to give you four, but they forgot once. Once a week, that's what you get, personal hygiene. Okay. Whose clothes are you wearing? You've been in a long-term care facility now for a month. Who's close? Well, you can read the label, you know, read the label sewn into the into the back of the shirt or whatever it is. It won't be your name, but, uh, you know, because why? Because that all goes together. And ask anyone who's had a loved one in long-term care. You know, you can buy all the clothes you want, thinking, well, this will be nice for mom or dad or whoever in the long-term care. Well, within a month or two, they're not wearing anything that you bought them or that they bought for themselves to the place because it goes into the wash and then God knows where it goes. Also, you've got a new roommate. Right? For the first time in umpty ump years, now you're sleeping in a room with somebody else who you didn't pick. Okay? And maybe that person keeps you up at night. Maybe, who knows, right? What we want to do 
right? Because it's not practical. Now, maybe it is for you, in which case, uh, you know, you can sign off. That'd be, that'd be just fine. Maybe for you paying $15,000 a month for the next three years is no big deal. Okay. Up to five years, you know, 20% or more. That's what you want to do. God bless you if you've got that ability. Most of us don't. Most of us don't. But we don't want the base level of care either. So what if we could plan ahead? What if we could work with the Medicaid, right, to qualify for the Medicaid and not go broke, to receive something back from what we paid in? We already paid it in. Be nice to get it back. Not everything back, but something. Why not? If it should happen to you. And you say, well, you know, I'll never need long-term care. I say, well, if the number is 70%, seven out of 10. If you're a married couple, that's 140%. So one of you is going to need it, or maybe every other neighbor down the street is going to, you know, maybe you're going to dodge that bullet. Uh, is that a plan or is that a wish? Well, it's up to you. So by planning ahead, by reserving some of what you've built up during your lifetime, right? some of what you've built up during your lifetime, by reserving that, now we'll take the base level of care, whatever the base level of care is. I call it three squares and three roommates. You get three meals and you can have up to three roommates, semi-private, okay? But maybe you don't want a roommate. Well, if you spend down, so your money's all gone, too bad, so sad for you. But if you've protected what you've earned throughout your lifetime, if you've used, if you've figured out, and we'll show you how, to use what you've got, right, to supplement what Medicaid will pay, well, maybe you can afford a private room. Medicaid doesn't, you know, if you just do what everybody tells you to do, you're not going to have anything left. There won't be any money to pay. You, you get what you get. But if we can retain, keep your life savings intact, then I can spend $1,000 more to get the private room. Maybe I want my own clothes. Well, I have to send them out to get them washed. That's going to be another $30 a week, let's say, another $120 a month. All right. Oh, boy. Up to what? $1,100 a month. So, holy cow. And then maybe. I got my own room. Maybe I want to shower every day. Well, let's not go crazy. Let's every other day. Right? Now I have to pay a certified nursing assistant to make sure that that happens as well. So maybe I'm paying not $15,000 a month for the basics, which I already paid for through my taxes. Right? I'm not repaying again, but because I kept my savings intact, in the hands of a loved one, spouse, chi child, whomever, right? Now I can afford those extras that make the difference between just getting by and an experience that reflects the dignity that you have. The, you know, I mean, you worked this hard. Did you work this hard to get the least? Or did you work this hard? so that your efforts count for something. You know, sometimes people say, oh, well, it's only money. Well, what is money anyway? Think about it. Here's a, here's a thought. What is money? I say money is choices. If you have money, you get to make choices. You get to decide things, okay? I don't want any roommates, all right, I want the room there with the bird feeder stuck to the window and a view of the bubble bath, you know, the bird bath, whatever. That's what I want. Okay, fine. You don't have to, ha you don't have to share the room. I'd like to wear my own clothes. Oh, what a, what a luxury that is. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'd like to shower more than once a week if they remember. Maybe I'd like to have that as part of my routine. Okay. Those all are those are all things that are going to cost extra money. Let me tell you, there was a occasion. This was years ago. Spoke with a uh, business office manager at a local uh, long term care facility, and I wish I had thought to ask the question. And I didn't. 
my sister Christine thought of it, and asked the business office manager, what's the worst thing that you have to face doing this job? Now, what do you suppose it was? This is somebody who's dealt with people who've gone broke, all right, and have to go now on the Medicaid when they're flat broke. Okay, this is someone who's dealt with death and dementia and all the rest of these things. What's the worst thing she had to face? And the answer was, the worst thing I have to face is telling women who have gone to the beauty parlor, even the nursing homes have beauty parlors in them, okay? And now they can't afford it. They can't get the perm once a month. They can't do it. They can't go there anymore. They can't get their hair done, you know, whatever. They're just going to have to get, you know, a nursing home hairdo. That's it. No more of that. That's the hardest thing. Well, what does it cost to get a permanent long-term care facility? 20 bucks? Not much. Not much. Not much out of what you've saved throughout your whole life. But it's the small things that have a huge impact on quality of life. Okay? Tell somebody that they've been doing something for their whole life and now you can't do it anymore because you're broke. How's that a way of driving home to somebody just what their situation is? Pathetic. And it doesn't have to be that way if we manage to retain as much as possible of your life savings. And it's the difference in quality. Let me, when I was in the military, I'm just one more story here. When I was in the army, they were still serving sea rations. Now, these were the combat rations. They started them, I guess, World War II, whatever. We had leftovers from Korea and Vietnam and all that. This was in the 70s. And the way they do sea rations, they come in a cardboard box, you know, the, like that. And inside is a couple of cans and brown uh, aluminum foil envelope, right? And little kits and stuff. Anyway, so that all comes in a brown box, a uh, little cardboard box, excuse me, just, you know, regular cardboard box. Printed on the top flap of the box is what's inside the box. Was it pork slices with juice or, you know, the uh, spaghetti and meatballs or whatever? That was on the top flap. Now, whenever they serve out sea rations, combat rations, what they always would do is they would flip the box, the crate that contains about 12 of these things. They flip it upside down and they would open it from the bottom. Now, why do you suppose they opened it from the bottom? Well, the answer is because, because it was all assorted, right? Different kinds. If you could see what you were getting, there's no way in hell you'd get that one or this one. You'd only go, okay? So nobody knew. You just went through the line. You boom, boom, boom. The first time I ever pulled a sea ration out of one of those cases, I got the booby prize. It was a thing called eggs with ham chopped. This was scrambled eggs in a can, scrambled eggs with ham chunks, right? From hens that had died during the Eisenhower administration. I gotta tell you, it was not a gourmet delight. But what I learned from that was never to go on another field training exercise. This is all I ever did. I never deployed, it was training. Never go on another FTX without my Tabasco. This is what we're doing here. See, the sea ration, the government, uh, combat ration, that's the government solution to the need that soldiers have to eat in the field. That's what it is. It's the government solution. And it'll keep you on your feet and it'll fill your belly and you know, you'll be fine. But what if you could make it a more pleasant experience by bringing something along with you? Okay, they're not going to give you... Nowadays, my son was in the military. Um, he's out now, but, you know, did Afghanistan and all that. Anyway, what he tells me is in the new super duper meals ready to eat, they actually come with the Tabasco. Well, not back in the day. <laughs> not when I was doing it. You had to bring your own. Okay. It made a world of difference to throw some Tabasco on eggs and ham chopped. Okay. That's what we're doing here with Medicaid. The whole idea is... Medicaid is the government solution. It's a basic solution, right? But if I bring a little bit of extra, 
it makes a world of difference. If I might, if my choices continue to matter because I planned, and you've got to plan ahead, right? I mean, when you're in the truck going out to the field or loading on the airplane or what have you on the helicopter, you can't, oh boy, uh, let me go get the, you know, I'll get it from the pilot, right? And you have the pilot give me some, it doesn't work like that. You got to plan ahead. You got to pack it. You got to get it. All the rest of this stuff. Okay. Same way with planning for the Medicaid. You got to plan ahead. But the consequence is now it's not great. I'm not trying to say that long-term care is ever going to be the Taj Mahal, the, you know, walk on the beach, whatever. It's not the Ritz Carlton. Okay. When you're in a long-term care facility, it's not an easy, I'm not, okay. Don't, let's not misunderstand each other, but especially in a situation like that, you know what I'm talking about. Little things make a big difference. The harder things are, the harder the circumstances, the more difficult the circumstances are, the more important the little things are. And by planning ahead, you can be sure to get those little things that make the difference between barely tolerable and intolerable. I'm not going to say better. It's not between, not between okay and better. It's between totally intolerable and okay. I'll make it. That's the that's really the difference. Now here's how Medicaid works. So what we do, and there is two situations when we do Medicaid planning. The least expensive, most effective way, least expensive. Most effective is the pre-plan. You can pre-plan for Medicaid. You can say, look, I'm not going to bury my head in the, in the sand. I'm going to accept the fact that as people get older, and once you're in your 80s, it's the majority of folks, right? 60s, you're okay. 70s, a few more people needing it. 80s, oh boy. All right, and then 90s and you know, obviously, people there are exceptions, but when you need the long term care, you need it and you can pre plan for it, or you can do what we call crisis planning. Crisis planning is when you bury your head in the sand and you say, That'll never happen to me until it does happen to you. And now we're struggling to hang on to what we possibly can. Are we all together on that. So the same qualifications are necessary for pre-planning and crisis planning. It's just, how do we go about that? How do we get, how do we meet the Medicaid, uh, the Medicaid requirements? We're going to talk about um, pre-planning first, and then we'll get to some of the ways that we can do crisis planning. Pre-planning is based on primarily on the federal law. law. Federal law says for all 50 states, Guam, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, states and territories, here's the rules for pre-planning, the ones that we're going to be talking about, the rules that we utilize for pre-planning. Okay, Because when you are doing a pre-plan, right, you want to know, you want to have good confidence that this is going to work even if you move out of state, even if you go somewhere else, right? You want to know that going forward into the future that the law doesn't change or doesn't change to the point where it defeats your plan, okay? Just a little bit of history. Until 2005, until 2005, which is 18 years ago, a long time now, right? But <laughs> I've been doing it for 33 years, so... Before 2005, there were all kinds of things you could do in Michigan so that pre-planning was not the good idea. Crisis planning is what we did. Don't worry about it. It's cool. There's so much great things we can do when the time comes. We'll fix it up when the time comes. So we were doing all crisis planning up till about 2005, 2006. Very, very few situations called for pre-planning because there was so much great stuff you could do. It wasn't that hard. But remember, our supply of people 
right, to provide services was still fairly high, and the number of people needing services was still fairly low. Okay, we had a pretty good match. Now, of course, in the last 20 years, that's gone like this. But back then, not that hard. They could see it coming. I think this is what happened. I think they could see it coming. Federal government could say, hey, pretty soon the demographics here are going to really wallop us in the chops. So we better start getting this stuff put together now as opposed to continuing to wait, which is why I believe they changed rules, why they took away the easy stuff you could do if you waited. Okay. But in 2005, 2006 really is when the law took effect. Um, now, I was one of those at the time. I was all upset because, oh, this is terrible. They're taking away all this great, easy stuff we can do to get people qualified for Medicaid. It'll be terrible. And it was kind of terrible. But, but, and it took me a while to figure this one out. The silver lining was now I've got Congress on board saying, if you pre-plan in this way, you don't have to worry about the state or any of the states changing the rules because Congress has said what the rules are. And you don't have to worry about some agency, right, like OSHA or whatever, uh, Health and Human Services. You don't have to worry about the agency changing the rules on you every month. You have to go back to Congress and change the law. All right? So two th good things about Congress taking over. The first was, now we know what the rules are throughout the United States. That was a good thing. The other thing was we can rely on these being the rules going forward. Because once Congress does something, it's very hard to get them to go back and change it. Are you with me on this? So that was the eventual silver lining. So this is why we like the pre-plan 18 years now of doing pre-plans. They work every time you do them. Um, there's nothing the state can say about it. They can't change the federal rules. And we can go from state to state. The rules still, the rules still work. Okay. So that's the that's the pre-plan versus crisis planning. And remember, let me just recap. Why do we have to do this? We have to do this because if you want to know how the federal government would treat you if they could get away with it, look at Medicaid. The fact that they are treating you differently with Social Security, they're treating you differently with regard to Medicaid, they're not taking your house, they're not depleting your savings, they're not doing all the rest of this. That's because, in my view, they can't get away with it because you're still voting, right? But if you they can get away with it because you've only got three years to go, right? If once you need the skilled care, right? Very and people are in total denial about this, right? Cleopatra wasn't the only queen of denial. <laughs> I get a few right here, right? You less than others because you're watching this. At least at least you get you get it. I mean, there's a there's an issue. Most people just close their eyes, close their ears, and don't worry about it. It's a way to do it, I suppose. Anyway, this is why the pre-planning is something. This is why we have to do it because they can get away with it in Medicaid. They can get away with stripping you of everything you've built up your entire life because you can't get back at them through the ballot box. Are you, are you with me on this? They can't get away with this stuff with Social Security or Medicare because you won't let them. When it comes to Medicaid, when it comes to long-term care, it's a different dynamic. And that's why this happens to you when it comes to the long-term care. All right? So that's the difference. If you're wondering, why do we have to do this? Why isn't it the same way the whole, well, are they being nice to us? No, you can hold them accountable. Here, you can't hold them accountable. That's the difference. Okay, it's not, there's no morality to this. It's not, oh, it's a good thing. It's a bad thing. It, you know, it's not a religion here. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is what will the government let you do? So do we have some, it looks like we've got a couple of questions. Is that right? Okay. So what are they?
Because they can. It, 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 it's it, there's no it's not a rational thing. It's because it's just what I was just saying. Because they can get away with it. That's why. That's why you're penalized. Because you you're not going to vote them out of office, right? They want your money to pay the to pay the bills. That's why. Does that make? I hope that makes sense. I mean, yeah, because. Say you've saved them enough money, so you don't need the Social Security and all the rest of it. Well, good for you. Very good for you. Okay. But with Medicaid, different story. And people, you so, um, maybe, maybe the question was, hey, look, I already took care of my long-term care. I'm saying, well, that would be great if you did. That'd be great if you did. So if you're thinking, well, I already got my long-term care covered. I don't have to worry about any of this, I would say to you. If you get a if you get a bill in the mail, bill comes in the mail today for fifteen thousand dollars. Let's say it's your spouse needs the long term care. Bill for fifteen thousand comes in the mail, or make it twelve thousand. Let's let's do the easy case. So only twelve thousand dollars. Hey, right? Which account are you going to take it from? Which account are you going to write the check from? And when that bill comes in next month, what account are you going to write it from? next month. And as the months go by, right, which accounts are you going to be paying those bills from? And so for three years, on average of skilled care, not all in the nursing home, not all, okay, 20%, five years or more, where are you going to get the money? Now, if you say, I don't care, I'm a millionaire, I say, well, I have millionaires come here all the time, or used to be millionaires, but they thought mom was going to die in a year. And the Wall Street Journal just had in the, in the summertime, they had an article. You know, that was the headline. We thought mom was going to die in a year. You know, a million, two hundred thousand dollars later, she's still in the nursing home. Well, you, it, this stuff is tough to predict. Our record around here is over two million dollars. The family went through over two million dollars before they finally came in. They still had a couple hundred thousand left and we were able to help out. But the point is, they went through millions. Does it happen all the time? Yeah, it happens all the time, as a matter of fact. It doesn't happen to everyone. But it's a, it's a routine thing. The most popular thing to do when it comes to long-term care, if you want to know, if you want to join the in crowd, you want to do what everybody else does, then do nothing. All right, hang up right now and I'll go have a cookie or another cup of coffee or something, right? And we, don't, don't worry about any of this. You can go broke like most people do. 98% of folks go broke. Why? Because they, they don't even look at this. Back in the day, and how do I know it's 98%? Because back in the day, there was an easy way. I told you this. There was an easy way to get people qualified for Medicaid. All right? Well, we knew how many people were doing it. Less than 2%. Less than 2% of people in long-term care were using this very easy thing. And you could figure out who was, you know, you could measure that. Less than 2%. So I say 98% of people just going broke. And if you want to, God bless you. I, I'm, you know, doesn't make any sense to me, but it's your own, it's your own personal choice. Do what you want. As for me, if I pay tax dollars in, I don't really expect anything back. But if it's possible, hey. I'm not I'm not opposed. Does that make sense? And then we had another question there too, Amanda, I think. Okay, what were they saying? Something about the facilities, I think. Yeah. So you can you can you can pay for that. Yeah. So you can you can get that. That's that's true. Uh in one of my newspaper columns I quoted from the um from the advertising that they do for nursing home uh, laundry detergents, you know, and it talks about remove, removes every, every, what was it? Removes all organic matter, you know, <laughs> blood, feces, urine, vanish, replaced by a lemony freshness. Well, okay. You know, and, and will they do it? Well, can you buy it done separately? Sure. You can buy it done separately, but that's not generally how it's done. And generally, the, the understaffing, given the understaffing that we have at 
long-term care facilities now, sorting it out is another is another issue. It, it, I, I will tell you, it did, it surprised me the degree to which families um, are upset when the clothes the clothes closet is full of somebody else's clothes. I didn't think it would upset people to the extent that it does, but what I found is that uh, many many families find it extremely upsetting um, that the clothes they bought for the long term care facility aren't being used or they vanished or you know, and then you get all different sizes and you have to you know you have to go through that. So, and if you can afford to do it, that's my point. How can you afford to do it? How can you get the you know, how can you get the care? That's the uh, that's the issue. I will say this. If there is a uh, if there is a facility out there that is doing actually doing separate loads, which I think is was the point of the comment, you know, that many facilities actually wash clothes separately. Um, OK, I'm not familiar with many, but Medicaid is accepted at a skilled nursing facility. Medicaid is accepted with the exception of, I think it's Freedom House in Zealand, is accepted by every long-term care facility, by every skilled nursing facility is what I should say, by every skilled nursing, they all accept Medicaid simply because that's how they get paid. I mean, no one can afford 12 to $15,000 a month. Well, except I guess a few people can, but you know, for regular folks, it's just not an option to keep on paying that. And so, that's why everybody takes Medicaid. So if you can find one that do, actually does the laundry separately, you know, well, if, if you know of one, put it in the chat that they actually do uh, residence laundry separately. I, I'd be interested in that. But then you could choose that as part of your, uh, when, when you get right down to it, because that facility guaranteed, unless it's Freedom House in <laughs> Zealand, uh, is going to accept the Medicaid. All right. So, how does it? How does all this work? Well, we have the pre-plan, as I said. Pre-planning. The way the pre-plan works is, it takes advantage of the law that is national, and what the law says is, if you give your stuff away. If you give your stuff away, we're going to penalize you for that. Okay, so if you give money away, if you give an automobile away, if you give a house away, if you give a cottage away, if you give away your dining room set, whatever it may be, okay, we're going to penalize you. Medicaid is going to penalize you for giving that stuff away. Are you with me on that? So they don't want you giving stuff away before you apply for Medicaid. They want you to spend your stuff first. Now, imagine you had a bypass. You need a bypass, right? And you go to the Medicare, go to the hospital and say, hey, I need a bypass on my chest, on my heart. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have a heart attack. It's going to be terrible. So please uh, pay for my bypass. And what if Medicare said, well, you know, you've got uh, 10000 in the bank. Come back and see us when it's 2000 or less. Come back and see us. Well, that's what Medicaid says, right? That is what Medicaid says. But if you gave away, so you say, oh, well, yeah, I got the 5000 in the bank. And I can only have $2,000. i am going to give my kid $3,000. Well, they don't want that either. They want you to spend that on your, you know, on your bypass so they don't have to. We all together? Right? Does that make sense? So if I you give the money away, well, that's a bad thing to bring your assets down. Okay, you give it to somebody else. Now they're going to penalize you. They're not going to pay for you because you gave the money away. But here's the thing. If you wait long enough after you gave the money away, five years, 60 months, six, zero months, right? So you give the money away now, Five years later, they don't care that you gave the money away. So if you apply for Medicaid four years and 11 months after you gave the money to your kid, you get hit with a penalty. 
But if you wait till month 61, now they don't care. Here's the idea. Zero is today. 60 is 60 months, is five years from today. So today, you give your kid $5,000. Give, give your kid five, for no good reason. Yeah, oh, I love you, kid. Here you go. All right? If you apply for Medicaid in this next 60 months, in this next five-year period, they will penalize you. They won't pay for you. And the penalty period doesn't begin right away. It begins when you're broke and in the nursing home. That's when it begins, when you are otherwise eligible for Medicaid. Well, what does that mean? What it means is the nursing home doesn't get paid. So the nursing home, right, not the state, the nursing home sues you and says, hey, you were supposed to pay us $15,000 a month, and now you're not paying us. How come you're not paying us? And you say, because uh, I have no money. You say, well, okay, nobody has any money around here after a couple of months. So uh, why isn't Medicaid paying for you? And you say, oh, because I gave stuff away to my kid. And they say, oh, well, now we're going to sue you and your kid. It's what they call under the doctrine of fraudulent transfer. We're going to go after you. We're going to after the person who got the money. Your kid got the money. We're going after them so that we get paid. Does this make sense so far? This is how it works. But if you gave the money away more than five years ago, more than five years ago, they say, look, uh, all the all the oxen free. We're only looking back five years. So if you gave it away 10 years ago, you're cool. If you gave it away five years and a month ago, no problem. Less than five years, problem. More than five years, and eh, we don't care anymore. Are you with me on this? So what you could do, what you could do if you wanted, is right now today, run out and give all your stuff to your kids. All right? Give everything you have to your kids. And then hold your breath for five years, I guess. And then when you need nursing home care, no problem, because you already gave all your stuff to your kids. Great idea, huh? Well, there are actually people out there doing this. There are actually attorneys out there, I've heard of them, who tell people, well, just give it, put your kid's name on the deed, or deed it over to your kid, or you know, put them on the account, or all these kinds of things, you know, to get to give the money in effect to the kids. The only problem is. Well, you know your kids, right? Do you want to be living in your kid's house? Do you want to be asking your kid for money? What about your kid's spouse? Remember you thought he was Dudley Do-Right and he turned out to be Snidely Whiplash? I mean, come on. You're going to leave your stuff with your kids? What are you, nuts? No, and so you don't give your stuff to your kids. Well, you could if you wanted to, but... It, Really, is that, is, that what, is that what we earned it for? So we could just, you know, we're still here. You know, what if the kid, uh, <laughs> you know, there's so many crazy things going on. You know, how about this idea that you can bet on sports while a game is on? You heard that? Remember, I mean, isn't that what the mafia used to do was do that kind? Well, you, you just entrusted your kid with all your money. And your kid is sure that, you know, you know, MSU is going to beat U of M this year. You know, we'll be, you know, look at the odds. Oh, it'll be great. Okay. Then it's not great. Then what happens? Well, there goes your money on a bet. You know what I'm saying? And it's not just that, of course, obviously just living and there's divorces. Some people do get divorced. And, you know, I don't know if you're aware of that, but that does happen sometimes. And there goes the money you gave to the kids. So, so why would we do that? Not a great plan. In my humble opinion, to give all your stuff to you. Now, if you want to give all your stuff to your kids, you know, we can we can arrange that too. But what if instead, what if instead we took your life savings, 
and we put it into a trust, a trust that you were the trustee of. You're the trustee of this trust. Now, there are some requirements on it, of course, to comply with the Medicaid rules. But who invests this money? You do. Who gets the money when you're gone? I don't know. Depends on what you want. You can change it however you want. You can change it whenever you want. Well, you, we put the house in here. Why do we put the house in? Okay. You say, well, Medicaid gives me the house. I can keep the house in a Medicaid situation. Not so fast. You can keep the house if you, but how about paying the taxes on the house? Who's going to do that? Because your money is all now either gone or, and your income, except $60, is going to the, uh, going to the nursing home. Who's going to pay the taxes, utilities, upkeep? Who's going to do all that? Who's going to lay out that money? My experience is the kids will do it for about two years. After two years, they don't want to do it anymore. They're tired. Their spouse is tired of doing it. So they leave it alone. And then every year, every spring comes around and a whole bunch of houses get forfeited because the kids didn't feel like paying the taxes on it. Well, that was a brilliant idea. Okay. But what if I put it in the trust? I put the house in the trust. I put the money in the trust. Now I've got enough money to keep on paying those taxes. And here's the beauty part of it. For Medicaid purposes, and when I say Medicaid purposes, I mean not common sense purposes. I mean not logical purposes. I don't, you're going to have a real hard time with it. I'm going to tell you right now, you have a real hard time with this if you're trying to be logical, okay? <laughs> so forget about being logical, right? Have you ever, have you prided, do you pride yourself on common sense and just understanding basically how things work, right? That's served you well so far. It will not serve you well when it comes to Medicaid because that is not how this stuff works. It's a bunch of rules. It's like taxes, put it that way, it's like taxes. You follow the rules with taxes, you get the deduction, you get the credit, tax credit, whatever it is, you get what the rules allow you. But if you do not follow the rules, you get squished. It's the same way with Medicaid. And what I'm telling you is that the Medicaid rules allow us to put your stuff in trust and that will trigger, trigger the five-year period, the 60-month period. What does that mean? What it means is at the end of 60 months, in month 61, you can apply for Medicaid. You can apply for Medicaid in month 61, five years after, five years plus a month, after you put the assets into the trust. Nothing in the trust will count against you for the Medicaid. Not your house, not your savings, not your stocks and bonds, not your mutual funds, not your cottage, cottage, not your hunting property, not your farm. None of that will count against you after five years. This is why we call it a pre-plan because you have to be thinking about this. You have to go to the commissary. You have to buy your Tabasco. You have to remember to put it in your ammo pouch. You know, you, you have to bring it with you. Okay, you have to pre-plan and act so that now time is on your side. Right now, time is not on your side. Every month that goes by, right, is just another month. Whatever assets you have, you still have them. Right now, Michigan, we talk about the house. You got a house. Michigan is one of just a few states that does not put a Medicaid mortgage on your house. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. We have people who have moved from all of those states to Michigan, to Michigan, because Michigan doesn't put a lien on the house. But if they went to the nursing home in Indiana, if they went to the nursing home in Ohio, right? And now the Medicaid comes in and pays, the state of Indiana, the state of Ohio is going to take the house, the farm, the cottage. But if they come to Michigan, Michigan, they come to Michigan and now they get the long-term care. They come to a nursing home in Michigan 
and Michigan Medicaid pays, they're not going to go back to, Michigan does not go back to Indiana or Ohio to glom onto the house. Are you with me on this? That, 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 that's how it works. Now, the question is, how long will Michigan do this? When does Michigan say, hey, everybody else is glomming onto the house. Everyone else is getting the farm. Everyone else is getting the hunting property. How about us too? Let's come after it and start doing the Medicaid lien, the Medicaid mortgage. I don't know when the state's going to do that. I don't know. They keep talking about it. They almost tried it back in 2012. They almost passed it, but it didn't get through. Okay. So what else what else do we have here? Um the answer to the facility that washes care cardinal and Wyoming. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Each provide digital laundry services. So there you go. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. The next one is yeah. who transfers the property and assets into the trust? Does this happen automatically? Or is there an additional expense for that? Well, so that's a that's a very good question. Who puts your stuff into the trust? Is there no? Most estate planning fails. Okay, I'll just tell you right now. Most estate planning, I have no patience with it. I view it as a scam. I've said that on the radio, I've said that on TV, I've said that in person, I've written it in the newspaper. I think that most estate planning, the way it's done right now is a way to get people to pay a bunch of money up front and to still have to go through probate on the other end of it for exactly the reason that the, the writer just said, because there is no follow through, right? See, you go, you get yourself a trust. Okay, great, I got a trust. Wonderful, I'm gonna avoid probate. Well, you got a, you got a bunch, you just bought yourself a bunch of paper, a bunch of documents, okay? And when you buy those documents, you haven't bought a solution, you bought a bunch of documents. Usually it's on top. Sometimes it's beneath, um, you know, sometimes at the end, but in that binder that you received that you bought and paid for, right? Remember, you didn't buy a solution, you bought a bunch of documents, okay? In there is a document that says, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, if you don't put your stuff into this trust, if you don't retitle your assets into this trust, you're going to go through probate anyway. Now, it doesn't usually say it that clearly. You know, you have to kind of, you know, double negatives and a, you know, a bunch of legalese and stuff. You have to figure out what the heck they're trying to, well, what they're trying not to say, which is if you don't put your stuff in the trust, the trust is not going to work, which is why most trusts fail. They almost all fail. Because, two reasons. One is there's no, they don't even work on their own terms. The idea here is, oh, I'm going to avoid probate. Forget about long-term care. They're not even worried about that. That's not even on the radar screen. But they don't avoid probate because your assets are not in the trust. In order for them to avoid probate, your assets have to be in the trust. If they're not in the trust, you're not going to avoid probate. Kind of simple as that. Okay? So what do we do? I mean, I figured that out. It took me about six months back in 1990. It took about six months because I've been working at the big law firm and they did the same thing. And everybody tells you, oh, of course, our clients are going to put the stuff in the trust. I mean, that, that was what they told you. Okay, that's what they told us. You know, that's what the other attorneys would tell. Oh yeah, the clients are going to take care of that. Well, after six months on my own, I realized that nobody was putting anything in the trust so that if we didn't do it, if we didn't have a process for that, it was just never going to happen. And so for 33 years now, we've been the ones putting, whether it's real estate or bank accounts, annuities, financial, all, and we've gone through all kinds of different ways of making sure that that happens, so all kinds of different processes, procedures. We're doing a, a thing now where we're doing a group, right? So you tell us what you have. We'll give you the forms. We have some services that'll, you know, here are the forms sign them, mail them in, you know, and now that'll change the assets over. All right. So we're doing that in a, in a group meeting and one on one when you have to. But the idea is if we did it all together, everybody's working together on their own stuff, you know, they're in the same room, but then we can provide a lot more service, right? Because not everybody needs the same level of help. But if I've got everybody here, instead of having to make the same 
thing 10 times, right? Instead, well, what we're doing right now, right? I could, we could have this conversation one-on-one -on -one 10 times. That's 20 hours. Or I can do it once to everybody answering your questions. And now, you know, it's two hours. So it's a lot more efficient. And when you have an individual question, I have more time to focus in on that, on that question. So long story, so I know it's kind of a long answer to a, a short question. We do that. Okay. We make sure that the assets are in the trust. When we do, we have a, we call it the red wagon club, because once your stuff is in the red wagon, we want it to stay in the red wagon. Okay. So we do a monthly thing um, where if you join the club, it's up to you if you want to do it, you know, do it yourself if you want to, but you join the club, there are a bunch of benefits. And part of that is as time goes by, if you sell a house, buy something else, move your account from here to there, that's all included. That's we're going to help you make sure that everything stays in that trust. Okay. So when you do this trust, right, when you put your house, you put your money, et cetera, et cetera, you put it in the trust. Now, 60 months later, right? Now it's off the table, which it's amazing. I'm just saying, you know, it's amazing. You turn around and five years are gone by. I mean, we're just talking with clients out in the, out in the hallway today. Even before I, before I came in here, we're meeting with one of the other, doing a trust review, doing the tune up, just making sure everything's still, you know, where it needs to be. But that's a, uh, but you know, they really weren't saying that, you know, it's, been like seven years and said, oh, I can't believe it's gone so quickly. Well, that's how it works. You know, it goes, it does go quickly, but because we're always in touch with the newsletters and everything else, now we make sure that the thing actually, actually works. And there's been plenty of changes since the COVID, I gotta tell you. But, you know, when you have a process for that, then it works and we're not one of the, you know, I, I, I've seen 96% fail I mean, is what I've I've seen that survey. I, I don't know if I'd say 96% personally, I'd say at least 90% of them fail because people just do not fund the trust. That's just that's just the way of it. Okay. Are we any other questions, Amanda? Okay. So when we put the stuff in the trust, we wait 60 months. Now you might say, well, wait a second. That's not so good. You know. I got to wait five years for this to work. That's that's a long time. I get no benefit. I get this thing all set up. I get no benefit for for what? Five years. That's terrible. I say, well, not oh, hang, hang on just a minute. Just a minute. Let's say you have. I don't know. Let's say you have eight hundred thousand dollars. Eight hundred thousand dollars. Ooh, that's a lot of money, $800,000, including your house. No IRAs. IRAs are different. I'll talk about that. But let's say you had $800,000, your house plus savings, $800,000 altogether. Okay? Well, if you have $800,000, how much of that $800,000 is at risk? How much? How much is at risk? All of it, right? It's all at risk. You haven't done any, if you haven't done any planning, that's well, all at risk. So remember it's zero to 60. You've got 800,000 at risk. Let's say you create one of the trusts, like I'm talking about, and you put your 800,000 in the trust. Okay, this is going to be the worst case scenario, worst case. Okay, you put your 800,000 in the trust, house plus cottage plus whatever it is you got, 800,000 worth goes in the trust. Now, before you had 800,000 at risk. And the next day, the day after you set it up, the very next day, you have a stroke, an aneurysm, get hit by a car, brick falls on your head, I don't know. And you wind up in a long-term care situation. And let's say, right? Cause you got some social security pension, whatever else. Let's say that your cost out of pocket is $10,000 a month, $10,000 a month. All together on that, it's going to cost you 10,000. And this happens the day after you set up the trust, the very next day. Well, the trust doesn't do you any good. 
not so fast. Not so fast. Because you had 800,000 at risk, right? You have 800,000, you have 800,000 at risk. Makes sense. But now you get hit on the head, whatever. And for the next 60 months, because remember, I got to make it 60 months. For the next 60 months, I've got to pay $10,000 a month. How much is 60 months times 10,000 a month? Well, the answer is easy. It's 600,000. Oh my goodness. That's a lot of money. Are you with me on this? I started with 800,000. Now I've got to spend 600,000 on long-term care. Ouch. Terrible. Right? But you know something about 600,000? 600,000 is not 800,000. Just saying. 600,000, not 800. How much did I shelter on the very first day? The answer is on the very first day I sheltered $200,000. I had 800, right? On the first day I sheltered $200,000. Worst case scenario. But you know something? I don't really feel like going into nursing because it's what, it's, uh, October right now, right? I like to pass out the candy at Halloween. I may have gotten hit by a brick on the head, but I'm not going to go into the nursing home till November. I'm not going to go in the nursing home in October. No, Halloween's too much fun. Well, if that's the case, then I don't have to pay for 60 months anymore. I only have to pay for 59 months which means I just sheltered another $10,000, right? Because I don't have to pay for 60. I only have to pay for 59. And of course, come November, you're like, well, you know, I'd rather have Thanksgiving at home. I just sheltered another 10,000. And of course, after, what comes after uh, Thanksgiving? What's the next holiday? Christmas. There's another, I don't want to give up Christmas. Are you with me on this? Here's the idea. I sheltered a certain amount on the very first day. But then as every month goes by, I'm stepping my way towards the finish line. Do you see? With the pre-plan, not only do I shelter a certain month, certain amount, immediately as I move forward, right? As I go down the track, I'm sheltering more and more each month. So it builds. So th this idea that, oh, nothing good happens for five years, that's just false. The good things start happening the first day and then just continue on. Any question about this? As I say, this does not count account for IRA assets. And I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how cr basic crisis planning works. Okay. And then we can talk about IRAs because IRAs for crisis planning and for pre-planning are about the same because I cannot put an IRA, 401k, 403b, 457, uh, thrift savings plan, uh, railroad retirement. I can't put any of those tax advantaged assets into this trust. I can put real estate in the trust. I can put businesses in the trust. I can put cash, I can put investments, I can put annuities all into this trust. I can do all that, but not IRAs, not 401k, four, it doesn't matter if it's Roth or traditional, either one. Can't put it in the trust, can't do a pre-plan uh, with it. That makes sense? And you say, well, that's pretty terrible. You know, and let's just say here, oh, it's terrible. I only have 200,000, right? I only have 200,000. Well, when you're on the Medicaid, when you're on the Medicaid and you have 200,000, you now have 200 months, 200 months, that's a long time, right? This is about a thousand bucks a month to get a private room. You get 200 months of a private room. That's almost 10 years. Uh, certainly the three years, you get no problem, 36,000, right? You've also got your CNA. And if you're not at, what was it, Cardinal Care? If you're not at Cardinal Care, 
So go to cardinal care. That'd be a good one, right? But at cardinal care, they'll do the laundry set. Well, if you didn't get, if you didn't wind up there, now you can, you know, you can get your uh, get your laundry done. I wonder if cardinal care also does a uh, does the hair for free, as well. If they do, okay. So the bottom line answer is where the, there is nothing automatic about it. It's not automatic. It's work to be done, but it's built into the process. So is the built into our process is the follow through as the years go by. We have, you know, long term relationships with uh, with our families uh, through newsletters, through visits, all, all the rest of that, um, because it, it, I think the if the point is, hey, this is not just a matter of buying some documents and I'm done. This is really much more a matter of initiating a relationship and maintaining that, which has been, I'll, I'll just a little sideline here, which has been, frankly, quite expensive to do, okay? You come to a workshop and then to work one-on-one, -on -one, very expensive. So what we've done just recently is we've cut the cost of putting this all together. We've cut it in half less than half for a lot of folks, depending on your IRA situation, less than half. But the way we're doing it is we do a workshop and then we do a workshop to design. Then we go one-on-one. -on -one. We do one-on-one -on -one to verify the design. We just make sure that everything is the way you want it. But then we do a workshop for signing. We do a 30-day workshop, a 60-day workshop, a 90-day workshop, but more follow on if necessary to make sure that all your assets are in the trust. Okay. But by moving from a hundred percent one-on-one -on -one situation, right? Just one-on-one -on -one to a more of a group setting. Okay. Cut the cost in half and delivering the same asset protection, same long-term care protection, what you wind up with at the end of the day is the same thing. Now, there are some people for whom it's not appropriate. Business owners, if you've got rental properties, stuff like that, then you might want to consider uh, the one-on-one -on -one is still a viable option <clears throat> for for you if you're in if you're in that situation. But um, but for most regular folks, where we've got the house, a cottage, maybe a cottage, uh, maybe something else, you know, kind of the usual situation. The you know, it's a lot less expensive. But this is the this is the thing. We've never backed off for 30 years, never backed off. You gotta plan for long-term care. If you don't, you're not planning for long-term care, you're not planning. It's as simple as that. And I'm not expecting you to do things that I know you're not going to do. I know you're not gonna fund the trust. You know, except for the engineers out there. And if you're an engineer or an executive secretary, you'll probably fund your own trust. Okay. But even the engineers in the, <laughs> even our engineer clients like the assistants, okay? But other than that, so that's the, that's the commitment we make, right? See, it doesn't help if I avoid probate, but you've got nothing left because it all went to a skilled nursing facility or to other forms of long-term care that could have been covered by, by the Medicaid. You don't have to lose your house. You don't have to lose the cottage. You don't have to lose your life savings. We can get all that for you and still qualify for your fire for the long-term care. Now, here's a question that some people have. Well, you know, the Medicaid rate is much less, much less than the private pay rate. Well, I'm, that's not right. I won't get the quality of service. Well, you need to understand how Medicaid works in Michigan, at least. It's different in other states, but in Michigan, Medicaid is cost plus. So each facility, and there's a 13 digit code for each facility, but each facility has to explain to the state of Michigan how much it costs for a month, the Medicaid reimbursement rate. So they have to explain to the state how much does it cost to keep this person in skilled care, all right? And it's a three year average. So the last three years, three year trailing average plus profit. Profit is added to what it actually costs. So in a skilled nursing facility, everyone who's on Medicaid is actually contributing not just what it costs, but they're actually contributing to a positive bottom line, to a profitable bottom line. If you had 100% of people in a long-term care facility, if they were all on the Medicaid, 
right? Then the place is making money. That's how it works in Michigan. Now, if they're not, then they didn't do their, you know, they poorly managed, I guess, because they're not on the Medicaid people only is what I'm saying, right? Because they didn't keep their rate base up because they didn't, you know, they didn't figure all their costs in. But if they're well managed, then every, every Medicaid client is providing the cost plus profit. That's just the way it works. Now, most long-term care facilities are having a very difficult go of it because there are a lot of people, right? The families won't finish the Medicaid application. The, um, they gave money away. They're in a penalty phase. There's lots of ways that people fail to qualify for the Medicaid. But if you've pre-planned, right? If you've thought about how this works, if you've pre-planned it, there's no reason for you not to qualify immediately, very smoothly. So you go from a, we had money to here's where we are right now, and we've got this much protected for the extras that the facility has to offer. So our clients not only are being paid for through the tax dollars that they already contributed, but they're also paying additional for the extras that they choose. They don't have to if they don't want to, but if you know if the family, you know, if the individual can figure it out, or if the family says, yeah, let's get the extra, well, that's what the money's for. You know, people want to pay for their own long-term care. I get it. Do you want to, but does that mean you want to pay twice? Is it a bad idea to make sure that your tax dollars actually provide some benefit to you as well as to everybody else? I have a real hard time seeing how that's a uh, how that's a bad thing. Okay, so this is long. This is the long term care, right? But this is the pre plan. What about crisis planning? Are we? Uh, are we okay? We're working again. Are we frozen? Okay. I love high tech stuff, don't you? Okay. So, so here's crisis planning. Crisis planning is I didn't do anything. Crisis. All right. Um, just had this case today. The, uh, the kids are planning that, uh, that mom's going to move in with them. They're building a house that's handicap accessible, all the rest. Then mom has an aneurysm, winds up on the floor of the shower, is discovered 18, 16, 18 hours later, right? She's half purple because, you know, once the hot water was done, now it's cold water. She's been sitting in it. Now she's in a long-term care facility. So went to the hospital first, then to the rehabilitation to the long-term care facility, skilled nursing facility for rehab. Here's how rehab works. Remember we talked about Medicare. Medicare on its own will pay for 20 days of rehab. Are you with me on this? All the facilities love to get the bonus money that comes from rehab. Okay, because they pay extra for the rehab. But after 20 days, after 20 days, Medicare will not pay, excuse me, Medicare requires, and this is the traditional Medicare, okay? The, the Advantage plans all have different rules, but the first 20 days are paid for. After that, for the next 80 days, you have to pay a copay, almost $200. It's $188.50 now. Right, well, you have to pay that much money every day. You say, "Well, one hundred eighty-eight dollars—that's a lot of money." Uh, doesn't that cover the whole thing? No, because it's four or five, six hundred dollars a day for a rehab. You're paying the copay. That's how that works. Now, if you have long-term care supplement insurance, not an Advantage plan, because but the Advantage plans, you just got to read through them and figure out what's going on with each individual Advantage plan. But with a traditional Medicare supplement plan, 
they'll pay the copay for the next 80 days. But back in the day, we used to be able to rely on 40 days, 30 days, 80 days of care, right? Because people didn't worry about it too much. Well, everything is screwed down now, tight as a drum, okay? You're lucky if you get the 20 days. This lady in the shower, she got the 20 days. Good for her. Unusual. Good for her, but unusual. And now the family's like, oh, my God, we got to pay. How are we going to pay the $188.50 a day? Right. And they thought that was the whole cost. It's a it's a fraction of the cost. It's the copay. Right. And they have now they said, OK, you're done with the you know, done with the Medicare. OK, so they appeal it. There's a 24 hour appeal. There's a 14 day appeal, something like that. Well, nobody wins those appeals. I mean, I'm sure somebody in the world does. I'm just not aware of any. Because people put in for the appeal and it gets turned down. They put in for the appeal, it gets turned down. And now you're right back, you know, you're right back where you, uh, where you started again. Now you're doing private pay and you're paying for the, you're paying for the entire thing. Okay. That's what we call crisis. So if you think you've got a hundred days, don't worry about it. There was a time, there was a time when that wasn't crazy, when that was, yeah, pretty much true. Pretty, you know, the physical therapists, we used to say physical therapists, most optimistic people in the world, they always think someone's going to get better. And so they'll extend the therapy period throughout the entire 100 days. I mean, that used to happen. I don't deny it. But what I'm saying is that's that's like 10 years out of date. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And it's certainly out of date now. It just doesn't work that way at all. OK, so if you're in a crisis situation, there's two situ there's two cases, right? One is I've got a husband and wife. Got a husband and wife or I've got a single person. And here it's different. When you do a pre-plan, it doesn't matter if you're single. It doesn't matter if you're married. All right. The same principles apply, single and married. Doesn't matter if you have kids. No matter if you don't have kids. I'm not planning for your kids. Screw the kids. Right. This is not about avoiding probate, saving taxes, getting it to the kids. This is all about how do we hang on to your stuff for you in the pre-plan. Okay? But now we're in crisis. I got a married couple. I could have a single person. I'm going to deal with the married couple first. And let's say these are our folks, and they've got $800,000, let's just say, $800,000, uh, 200000 of house, and 600000 of investments. Okay? $200,000 a house, which is exempt, which they won't count. And husband goes into long-term care. Okay. Now, these are people with 600000 in savings and a $200,000 house. All right. The first thing we're going to do is deed the house over to the wife. Why? Because the house can, the spouse can have a house, but I need to get his name off it. Because if it goes through probate, the state's coming after it, and I don't want that. So let me give it to her. Let me do that right now. I don't have to worry about anything. I get the house to the spouse. House to the spouse. I don't know that. All right. How about the money? Well, I've got 600000 You may have heard that the state will let you keep, will let the spouse keep half of the money. That is not true. That's not accurate. That's the whole story. OK, the state will let you keep the first roughly twenty eight thousand dollars. If you got twenty eight thousand, you can keep all of it. But the next twenty eight thousand is going to the state, going to the nursing home. All right. Before you will qualify for Medicaid, so you get to keep the first bit. Then that much goes to the state and then they'll split it with you until you get to until the spouse gets to keep about one hundred fifty. Call it. It's one hundred forty eight. 147,000 and change. Let's just call it 150,000. So when the spouse gets 100, when you're at 300,000, you get to keep half. Everything over 300,000 goes to the state. So the maximum that mom can keep, the maximum is $150,000, which means that 450,000, we got to do something with. Notice I didn't say spend down. We don't have to spend it down. 
I know everybody tells you you got to spend. You don't have to spend it down. We're not going to spend it down. Instead, the state of Michigan has always, except for a hiatus there when the Department of Health and Human Services said this doesn't work, and then the Supreme Court said, oh, yes, it does. Supreme Court of Michigan said, yes, it does. There's a trust that mom can set up in the moment, not five years ago, like in the crisis where I can put that $450,000, I can put it in the trust. Now, mom, and then it's off the table. Mom cannot be the trustee of this trust. Somebody else has to do that. Could be a kid, could be a bank, could be a trust department, all right? But not mom. Mom cannot be the trustee of this trust. And once a year, money has to come out of this trust and go to mom, sort of like an IRA with a required minimum distribution, kind of like that. But not like that because it's not taxable. And mom can put the money right back in the trust, which is what we typically do. So the money comes out of the trust, the money goes back into the trust, and it's still there for mom. And we say, well, if you've got this, why would we ever do a pre-plan? Let's just wait. No, you don't want to wait because this is under the rules for the state of Michigan. What if Michigan changes the rules? Then this goes away. OK, you got to take the long view and you got to understand that we're planning here in an environment where we don't know what's going to happen. I know most of you guys, you know exactly what's going to happen for the next 10 years. Right. I'm an idiot. I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone the next 10 years. So I'm not going to pretend that I do. I'm going to acknowledge that I don't. Right. And so do we use these? Sure, we use these. Absolutely. They work. And the last time they took it away from us, they grandfathered them in. So everything that we had set up beforehand still worked. And this works now. Will it work five years from now? I don't know. I don't know. I'm guessing not. I don't, but I don't know. This I know, this I have a high degree of confidence and I don't know this either, right? But I have a high degree of confidence that this will work because Congress hasn't monkeyed with it in the last 18 years, why would they start now? <laughs> That's a stupid question. But <laughs> who the hell knows what Congress got to do for whatever reason, okay? But this, at least, I've got I've got a long hit, and it's Congress, right? So are they likely to do it or, or do nothing, or more likely to do nothing, okay? I think they're going to leave this alone because not many people are doing this, you see? Whereas this one, I don't know about this one either, and not many people, oh, I already told you, 98%, they just go broke. Can you imagine that, right? You're in the nursing home and your wife, your spouse, could be a husband. I've seen husbands do it too. <clears throat> my own dad, my mom went in the nursing home. My dad's like, David, I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. I'm like, but dad, I told you to do these things. You know, I, I, I have some idea what I'm talking about here. Uh, I had to do it for him because he'd have walked right off the cliff. He was in the process of doing that. My own dad. And then he wanted to know, David, is this legal? Is this legal? Come on, Dad. All right. But it worked as it always works. It saved the house. And we're, this is Massachusetts. Saved the house, saved everything. He was fine until he passed a couple of years ago. But the point is, the point is, okay, that all this can be done at the time under current law. But we're not going to rely on the law not to change. Because what do we know about the law? It changes. That's what we know. And I'm not going to ask you to bet on an unknown future. Instead, I'm going to do. And the other thing, of course, as we do this, we put all the tools in the toolbox. So whatever they come up with next, we'll be able to maximize what you've accomplished, minimize the risk, no matter what the situation is. Because change is the one thing we can count on. But this is what we do basically in a crisis case. There are lots more things, but I'm running out of time here. So I want to get to what we do with single people and then we'll take your questions. So for a single person, crisis, for a single person, and again, let's say it's, um, you know, it's usually, usually the surviving spouse is female, right? We can admit, all the you know guys die first, 
Right. You see, but, but you see, that's why this is so important. Right. Because what would mom have left? See, dad dies. They've, they've got a house and six hundred thousand. How much would mom have if we hadn't done this? The answer is one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. Half of what you've got. So you say, well, oh, I don't care about that. I've only got 200,000. I say, OK, fine. How'd you like to have 100,000? Your spouse goes in the nursing home. Right. And now you got 100,000. Oh, and by the way, the spouse has taken a chunk of his Social Security or pension or whatever else it is. OK. I mean, how do you want to go for the next? Because if you're female, you're going to beat us by 10 years anyway. All right. And if you're younger, we'll just add that number. So is it 15 years? Is it 10 years? What is it? And you've got to make it on 150000 at the maximum. Wouldn't it be better to make it on everything that the two of you built up during your life? Wouldn't that be better? I tend to think so. So, but let's say it's a, now it's a single person, right? Now, mom has got the house, 200000 but we put that in trust so it doesn't count anymore. All right, let's just say we took that off the table. But now I've got, let's say, Mom's got 400,000 left. She's got 400,000, single person, mom or dad, doesn't matter, okay? And that person is now in the long-term care. What can we do in crisis? Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take 200,000 of the 400,000 and we're gonna give it away. We're gonna give it to one of the kids. Here you go, kitty. Have $200,000. Say, but wait a second. That's bad. Bad to give money away. Especially them rotten kids. I say, yeah, but we're in crisis, so I, I don't really have any alternative. And when I give away the $200,000 to the kid, I'm creating a 20-month, 20-month penalty period. For 20 months, Medicaid won't pay. Medicaid will not pay. And remember, that penalty period, 10000 a month that I gave away, for every 10000 I give away, one month penalty period. That's the way it is right now. It's nine ninety seven or something like that right now. Okay, but it'll go up again next year. It keeps going up. Let's just say 10000 can we? All right? So for 20 months, Medicaid will not pay. All right? And that only begins when mom is broke. But you say, wait a second, mom's not broke because you've been following along here. And yeah, I gave away 200000 I put that in the bag over here and gave it to one of the kids. But what about that other 200000 I still have that. I don't qualify. I don't start the penalty period. I understand. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take that 200000 and put it into an annuity, a Medicaid-friendly annuity. Isn't that friendly? A Medicaid annuity. And that annuity is going to pay $10,000 a month for the next 20 months. And I'm assuming that it costs $10,000 over and above pension and Social Security. Let's just assume it costs. I'm trying to make the numbers easy here. Okay. So I've put the other two hundred dollars into a qualified annuity. A qualified annuity. When it's in, not just any old annuity. It doesn't work like that. It's got to pay that money out on a fixed schedule. So for the next 20 months, the next year and a half, Plus a little bit, right? It's paying the nursing home. Are we all together on this? It's paying. How's the nursing home getting paid? It's getting paid from the annuity. The nursing home gets paid at the full private pay rate every month. Every month they're getting paid. They got nothing to complain about. Why can't they complain? Because they're getting paid. Okay. But as the months go by, so does the penalty period. We all together on this? The penalty period begins when mom has no more money. When our client has no more money. When do they have no more money? When it's in one of these annuities, because now it's not money anymore, it's income. Plus I gave away the other 200, that's just gone. That doesn't count anymore, because. but I got a penalty period. So for the next 20 months, 10,000 a month gets paid out of the annuity, to pay the nursing home to keep them happy. Why do we want the nursing home happy? Why wouldn't we want the nursing home to be happy? They're taking care of your mom. The, the, it's not easy running a nursing home. It's pretty darn tough in this environment, today's environment, regulatory and everything else. 
you know, try to find anybody who's good to work at a nursing home. If they're working in a nursing home, they're very special people, very nice people, probably. They've got a heart for it because everybody else is working McDonald's. Okay? That's the way it is. And if you're working in a nursing home, if you're running a nursing home, it's a very tough gig, very tough to do. Okay? So we want them to get paid. We're not looking to stiff the nursing home. We're looking to make sure that they get paid at the private pay rate for the next 20 months. But at the end of 20 months, the annuity is exhausted. There's no more money in the annuity because I paid it all to the nursing home. But there's no more penalty period. And so mom goes right on to the Medicaid. Okay? The nursing home gets paid every single month. Private pay or smooth transition to the Medicaid. And now, not only is mom on the Medicaid, which as you remember is cost plus profit, so the nursing home's not complaining about that, but the kids now have plenty of money, right? Plenty of money to keep on paying the taxes on the house and everything. They don't have to dig into their own retirements to do that. They can pay the taxes on the house, that'll be fine. And to buy the extras for mom, the private room, the hairdressing, the shower a day, the laundry, except for at, uh, except for Cardinal there where they already do that for you. Great. Keep it up. Um, but that's, that's how we do it. This is in a crisis, in a crisis situation. Okay. And they keep changing. Do they keep, yeah, they keep changing the rules. They make it the five-year audit, make you go back through five years to explain, well, yeah, they do that too. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's never ending the, the challenges. But the point is, would you <laughs> would you rather be broke? You'd rather be stuck in a nursing home trying to get by on what the state will let you get. You know, if you're the at-home spouse, do you want that? I can't see it. If you're in long-term care, do you want the bare minimum? Right? Do you want the government cheese? Well, okay, if that's that, that's it, fine. Right? But why wouldn't you want the extra that you have? earned because that's the only way this works okay remember this is not this is not for everybody this is for people like you otherwise why are you here right this is like people like you who worked who paid right you're not living your life kiting you're not kiting your life on a credit card right god forbid not that you never use them you do of course right but that's not how you live your life that's what this is all about do we have any, uh, let me just, open, I, I'll, I'll stick around as long as you want me to, as long as you have, uh, as long as you have any questions. Okay. And I didn't talk about, I did not talk about IRAs. I know that, but that's another, that's another half hour. Aren't you prolonging the care uh, that you or your family perceives that you need in your example? Um, I'm not really sure what that means. What do you mean prolonging the care? Um. How am I prolonging the care? Could if you could explain that, because I'm not really, uh, I'm not really understanding it. Um, the you uh, I mean over over here where where we was it in the example where I'm talking about? Oh, you don't go in the nursing home right away. You put it off. You put it off. But the point is that you you once you divest the assets, then you've got to pay private until you get to the end of the five year period, because. See, if you, if you divest 800,000, remember it's 10,000 a month. So the penalty period would go 880 months. Now, if this was a crisis, right? If you really did need the skilled care right away and there's 800,000, right? Then we would take, the house would be exempt. That, that's, the, that's the crisis example with mom. Oop. Trying to figure out where I am here. Yeah, that's the crisis example with mom, right? Where there's the house is exempt. I got the six hundred thousand. Mom gets to keep the one fifty. I got four fifty left, and I put that into the into the trust immediately. Okay. I was just using the, you know, keep that plan going just to show, just to illustrate that it's not a matter of five. You got to wait five years before anything good happens. Good things start happening right away. You know, you're you're cutting back on the amount that you might have to pay. Uh, immediately. So I think that's, a, if, if that was the question, but what, <laughs> if there wasn't, if that wasn't the question, then, then uh, help me out there. I'll, uh, you know, I'll try to answer, uh, try to answer it. 
There's a whole other thing we do with uh, with IRAs. We'll move them from one spouse to the other. We have to go to circuit court to do that. Um, where Medicaid planning is one of several factors in deciding uh, whether or not to move those assets. But again, that's that's a situation where King County Circuit Court, for example, had a problem with us doing that. They said, oh, you can't do that. So we go to the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals said, well, of course you can do that. That's really no problem. That's why we have a Court of Appeals so that if one judgmental body says one thing, you know, we can we can get review of that. And we were complying with all other states are doing. It's not a uh, it's not that big a deal. Well, it was a big deal because these this whole this family was being denied their benefits. Uh, but eventually we we did get it took three years, but we got relief from the uh, from the Court of Appeals. It takes a while. Sometimes these things take a while. So come on, we got 11 people out there. We got to we gotta have another question, don't we? Come on. Play stump the chump. Give me a hard one. Come on, we get the guy from the nursing home. Ben, give me a, give me a tough one. Um, Look, I can I can keep going. I do a two hour radio show every Sunday. I can you know, I can go to six o'clock if you want. But I'd I'd much prefer if you have a if you have a question that I you know I'd be more than happy to answer it. Um, you know, I don't think the Medicaid system's going anywhere. Um, it's just going to continue on. Uh, you know, you may have heard about the stuff at the south of the border and all that. Those people qualify for Medicaid as soon as they, as soon as they enter. You know, that's you, you say, oh, I don't deserve it. I mean, because I've heard this from people. It's like, oh, I, I should go broke first and blah blah. Well, before I get this government benefit, well. There are people who never contributed who are getting this government benefit. And you paid in. It's the same, exactly this, in my opinion. And I, I recognize there are some people who have different opinions, but they're wrong. You know, if, if you pay in, pretty tough to understand why you shouldn't get some benefit out. I mean, what else, what else do you pay for twice? I mean, would you pay for your car twice? Would you pay your rent twice? Why we? Why we, I just don't get it. You know, I'm. I'm sure that's a male, uh, a moral failing, on my part. I'm sure I'm. I'm a bad person for not understanding it. But uh, oh, do we do have some more questions? Okay, is this video available online? Yeah, for twenty four ninety five. Nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, it seems like no matter the strategy we pursue, it seems that we are always. This, no, no. Um, in a um. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, if you do the pre-plan, right? If you do the pre-plan, you're not in a spend-down situation. You you make it to five years and you're good to go. If you're a married couple, right? Then I can take all of what would have been spend-down, put it into that trust. I'm not spending that down. That's all for the benefit of your surviving spouse, typically mom, but typically the the wife, you know, the woman. I guess you can be a wife now without being a woman. But anyway, the point is, you know, we can preserve that typically for the one who lives longest, the females. Is that even a cat? Can you, can you say female these days? Help me out. Okay. All right. You Well, then I'll do it. I have, I, yeah, and I can do it. But, you know, females tend to live longer than males. Just It just seems to work out that way. And so most of the time when we do this planning, what we're really doing is we're providing in a married couple situation, you know, we're providing for that surviving spouse, right? We're not going broke. We're not going. See, because so often, I mean, why do why do you think why do you think the spouses die? A lot of you know, a lot of spouses die very soon after the the one dies and the other one dies six months later. How often have you heard about that? Well, frequently that's because by the time people reach out for help, by the time they employ a skilled nursing facility they should have done it years ago but they they absolutely bankrupt themselves physically bankrupted right they're exhausted they're beat up you know they've been you know think how much that guy weighs how much i weigh right and now you got to pick me up off the floor good luck for that 
right? How often, right? Think about this. And you're not a spring chicken yet e anymore either, you know? And, you, and now you're, you're taking care of your spouse. You're taking care of yourself. You're doing all that stuff. People are worn out and they're bankrupt uh, emotionally. They're bankrupt psychologically. And then the fact that, you know, you thought you were comfortable and now you're scraping again. I mean, really scraping, not not the kind of scraping that most of our clients, not the kind of scraping that you're doing right now, because there's a lot of people like me, you get the buck and a half hot dog at Sam's Club because why? Oh, it's only a buck and a half. Ah, I, you know, ah that, that makes sense to me, right? Okay, I get it. But you don't really have to buy the buck and a half hot dog with the, with the drink if you don't want to. I mean, you have options. What if, what if you didn't have, what if you couldn't afford the buck and a half hot dog? You see, that's what, that's what happens. And then you've been caring for them. They go to the nursing home, your life savings go down the toilet. And what are you supposed to do? Well, a lot of folks fold up and they die shortly after their spouse does, because they are just savings exhausted, person exhausted, everything exhausted. You know, take me home now, Lord. And I, I believe personally that that is what happens. Now, I don't know what the studies are, but I've just seen a lot of that. And I'm convinced that that's, that is what's going on a lot of time. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Going to send your info to a friend. Excellent. That's a good idea. Assisted living. Mom have a couple million. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really matter how much, how much you've got. Our, our fees are the same no matter what the net worth is because numbers are in a bank account. It doesn't. <laughs> it ain't my bank account <laughs> you know it's the same we're using the same tools no matter what the uh, no matter what the assets are there are however very important uh, and i haven't even gotten into the different kinds of medicaid there are there's at-home care there's two programs for that there's program of all-inclusive care for the elderly which we really strongly support we love that there's waiver if you need different kind of care right also at home then there is waiver for assisted living, and then there's skilled nursing Medicaid. So there are a, a wide variety of programs like PACE, Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. Even if you're in independent living, you can still qualify uh, for PACE. And once you're on one of these programs, all your meds are included, all the, you know, there's no more donor holes you gotta worry about. You get the durable medical equipment, uh, supplies, that's all included. Um, I really like PACE because the it's an organization. It's not just the individuals. And a lot, everybody wants you to receive the lowest level of care that's appropriate. Stay at home if at all possible. Everybody wants that pretty much. Uh, but PACE is really designed and uh, targeted to keep you home. But if you do need skill care, if they can't figure out a care plan to provide the services that you need and keep you at home, if that's the case, then it, they'll also provide for assisted living care. They'll also provide for skill care. And, um, you know, we just love PACE and people over there just, it's, it's like anybody you work with in this space, right? They're frazzled. I'm not going to say they're not. They are frazzled by trying to keep it all together. But, uh, but they're the nicest people in the world. I mean, a little at the wit's end, but because nobody gets into this, people don't get into this for the money. I mean, that's, that's not what drives people. Uh, what do we got there? What can I learn? Um, yeah, so you can go to the, you can go to the, um, uh, you can go to the state, you know, there's a, there's a website. Um, but uh, I guess what I, what I'd suggest is if you've got, if it's, um, if there's specific questions, just call us, we, you know, we're more than happy to, you know, take a phone appointment. We'll answer your questions. We don't charge for that. Um, but what you might want to do, if you've got someone you think has the need, right, has a need now for, uh, for care at home care, whatever, then the best thing to do, I would recommend, um, call, again, call us here, email us, whatever. Uh, we call it the discovery meeting. We've got a 40-year veteran from um, uh, Health and Human Services, Department of Health and Human Services on our team, our dean, uh, our dean Martin. And so our dean will give you a call back and go over 
all the parameters. What do you have? Where do you go? Blah, 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 all the all the details. Uh, then she and I will visit on that with another Medicaid paralegal, and we'll come up with some possible solutions uh, for you. And then, you, then once we've done that, you're more than welcome to come on in, and we'll talk to you about okay, based on what you told us, here's what we think is possible. What do you want to do next? So if if you're in that if you're in that state and there's never any charge until you decide because this is how we do it. It's like, okay, this is what we understood you have. Verify that that is correct, that the, that that is what you have. Then uh, go through the discovery. Here are some options. We can do this. We can do that. We can do the other thing. Do you need it immediately? Do you need it a little bit later on? You know, all that. We'll figure that out. And then we'll come to a fee. We do everything on a fixed fee basis. Uh, and it doesn't matter to us how money, how much money we're dealing with. The only thing that matters is what is it we have to do? The only variation fee is what is it we have to do to get you, you know, to get you qualified? Uh, there might be some variation, uh, variation that way. But there's never any, uh, you know, you know how, um, well, most attorneys charge by the hour. Okay, so how much is this going to cost? Well, I estimate so much. Well, it always winds up being more <laughs> most of the time, quite a bit more. Well, I told you it was an estimate. It's not how we do it. It's like, look, this is what it costs if we have to take an appeal. You know, if they say we were wrong, which we are never wrong, and we'll take it up on appeal and we'll win on appeal. I mean, that's our that's our thing. So we don't charge extra for that. We don't ask you to take us on faith. It's like, look, if we're telling you this thing is going to work, and if it doesn't work, because I can't just guarantee it. I mean, lawyers can't do that. I'm not guaranteeing that the court's going to do any particular thing. What I can guarantee is we will take it up just as high as it goes. We'll fight for your case because we don't, we're not doing this willy nilly. Now we have about, it's, it's only about half a percent, you know, about one out of 200 where we have an issue like that, uh, where we have to take it up on appeal, but we take appeals, you know, if they don't give us exactly what we asked for, we'll take an appeal on it because you know how it is. You can't, <laughs> you don't want to be a pushover. You know what I mean? You don't want to, if we're wrong, we're wrong, but we were very hard to make sure that we're not. So, uh, but that's the thing. So we're not asking you, you know, we're not asking you to, if the caseworker says something or other, we're not asking you to bear that cost. We'll, we'll take that, take that on ourselves. You know, the idea is sort of, well, maybe if we presented it better, if we explained it more, maybe they go our way. And we don't get hardly any of those anymore. Usually it's a mistake that the that the caseworker has made, you know, or a different interpretation, and then we'll fight it out. And that's that's just what we're willing to do. What else we got? Uh, the next step is we want to move forward with our coverage. Yeah. So, so we've got two. There's the pre-plan. There's the crisis plan. If you've got someone in crisis, well, either way, just give us a call, 616-361-8400. 616-361-8400. That's the, to the front desk. Um, then you have choice, right? You can either go to a discovery meeting, right, with our dean, because you've got somebody who needs care now or will shortly, either way. Needs care now or needs shortly, crisis, <laughs> see, I, see, I'm trying to get this right. Crisis. Uh, in a crisis case, we get you on the phone with our dean. Fine. If it's a pre-plan, then we'll schedule you for one of our, our workshops. Uh, we do a workshop that it's not only Medicaid. It's, it's focused on that, but it's not only Medicaid. Or you can sit down with one of our attorneys and we'll go over that with you at your convenience. So you have, we try to offer as much flexibility as possible. Would you like to meet with an attorney right away? Great, come on in. Doesn't cost you anything, right? We'll go through it. If this is something you wanna do, here's what it costs, fine, move ahead. Um, or you can come to the workshop and it's the same process, but now you're in with a group of other people. Or you can do the crisis. Crisis is almost always, it is fair to say it's always one-on-one -on -one because each person's situation is so uh, is so different. So, okay, is that my last question there? Oh, oh, so we're good. Okay, thank you all. I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.
have a cup of coffee.